Let's talk about the summer of 19, or 1974 and the summer of 2024. Here, you know, here we find ourselves, um, you know, in 74, the Republic was going through a pretty good stress test. Let's pick it up from there. Now, it is true. I mean, uh, all of the talk about bridges to the future or bridges to the past or whatever bridges, but there certainly are parallels between the melodrama of uh, the summer of 1974 which was full of the unexpected twists and turns and things that had never happened before, um, for which historians had no ready parallel. And uh, here we are 50 years later, and we're rewriting the script, but it's, uh, it feels like a script that has never been uh, tried before, um, with a uh, vice president who's suddenly the center of attention. Um, that probably a few months ago no one would have expected and no one knows what's going to happen but I suppose no one knew what was going to happen in 74 either I mean the ultimate uncharted waters the thing that I found I, still I find it hard to believe and yet uh, I've come to know the Fords well enough to, to believe it I swear they were the only family in the summer of 1974 around the dinner table who were not talking about Watergate and what might happen. Why uh, not? And well, because first of all, and, and you you have to realize th these <laughs> these were normal people. These were kids. The, the Ford kids um, never wanted to go into politics. I think, quite frankly, there was an element of resentment on the part of some of them, which you can understand. He was he was just away as much of the time as he was. Um, I think that was a problem for Betty. I mean, he, uh, I think, went to his grave feeling some guilt about, in effect, neglecting her and the, and the family because he wanted to be Speaker of the House. And that meant there were years when he was on the road for 200 nights a year uh, promoting uh, would-be Republican congressmen or congressmen who wanted to get reelected. But there was another reason, and that was because in his office, for example, he made it very clear, way down the law, no one was to discuss this. And that included his closest advisors. I mean, the people who, if anyone, would be, say, planning for a possible transition. And no one was allowed to do that. Consequently, there really was no transition. You know, as Mrs. Ford said later on, you know, most people get three months between an election and inauguration. You know, you know, we had 24 hours, which is pretty much accurate. But it was 24 hours because Ford understood. I mean, he was a good enough politician. He'd been around Washington long enough to know that if anyone around him or purportedly speaking for him were to be speculating about Ford becoming president, um, it would have been in the, in the press. Um, Ford also knew the last thing that he could afford was a perception. People forget, there was still, the day Richard Nixon left office, there were still 25% of the American people who supported him. And they were disproportionately Republicans. And the last thing Ford wanted to do, either on the personal level or equally important on the political level, was to appear to be staging a coup. And yet, Prior to even becoming president, he was already faced with a decision that he had to make when Al Haig showed up and had a list of oh, yeah. options for him. Yeah, the, the, the whole story uh, of the pardon, which in effect begins on August 1st when Al Haig shows up. First of all, you have to understand what is Al Haig's motivation. And probably the worst place to go for that is to read Al Haig's memoir. Uh, I, I, concluded after 10 years of research that Al Haig is um, uh, sporadically uh, reliable. But in this case, piecing all of the pieces together, Al Haig had decided that Richard Nixon had to go. And it was Al Haig's job, thankless job, to make it as, as painless, undramatic, and quick as possible. 
And, and so being Al Haig, it wasn't going to be Al Haig sitting down and telling Richard Nixon, you have to go. Al Haig wanted to enlist people in the periphery, people who Richard Nixon trusted. And that was a small group of humanity to begin with. And that's why, in my opinion, he went over to see Gerald Ford one week before Nixon's resignation to tell him in somewhat vague terms, you know, that you better be ready. Now, <laughs> the, the, the remarkable thing about that, and again, it gets to this issue of trustworthiness, um, Bob Hartman, who was President Ford's, I'd say, alter ego. He was a speechwriter, he was a political advisor, but he was, he was much more than that. He was someone that Ford absolutely implicitly trusted with his own political future. Uh, and to his credit, and they didn't make him a lot of friends, Bob Hartman was uh, professionally suspicious. And uh, he certainly didn't trust Al Haig. And the last thing in the world he wanted was to see his boss uh, sort of ensnared in the La Brea tar pits of, uh, of a Nixon pardon. So he insisted on sitting in on the meeting. And when Haig saw Bob Hartman, whom he distrusted, then he was less forthcoming than he might have been. Well, moments later, Ford goes up to Capitol Hill. He gets a call. It's Al Haig. I want to see you again, but I want to see you alone. And the interesting thing is, and I still go back and forth, Ford seems to be, some people thought naive. I don't think he was naive. I think Gerald Ford's, there are lots of people in politics whose immediate initial reaction in any situation is to be suspicious. What's their angle? In the Ford case, that was the last reaction. He, he thought people were being honest with him because he made it a habit of being honest with them. Now, if that's naive, call it naive. Is that West Michigan? That is, that is Grand Rapids. That is West Michigan, absolutely. That's the Eagle Scout. Um, one of the things of which Ford was, was, I think, most proud. He's still the only Eagle Scout president. Uh, but yeah, that's pure West Michigan, that the household he was raised in. We, you stop to think, I mean, to back up, the odds about against this story ever happening are so, are so phenomenal in, in so many respects. Not just what happened in August of 1974, but go back 50, 60 years. Um, when you think about how Ford's life began, um, the fact that he wasn't Gerald Ford uh, until he was 15 or so, uh, he was addressed as Juni, the diminutive of Junior, and he didn't know until he was an adolescent, whether he was being addressed as Junior King, the, the name of his birth father, or Junior Ford. And um, there, there was, <laughs> today we would assume that this is the formula for, quote, a broken home. It was a broken home. Um, one of the sort of drop dead moments for me, I. I was the first person outside the family to see Gerald Ford's baby book. <clears throat> and in it, there's this very poignant page, Baby's First Automobile Ride. Well, he was two weeks old. And his birth father, who was a scoundrel, no two ways about it, Leslie King, uh, walked into his wife's bedroom with a butcher knife, uh, threatening to kill mother and child. And Dorothy then King, later Dorothy Ford, extraordinary woman. And remember, this is 1913. Made arrangements, slipped out of the house two days later. So Baby's first automobile ride was across the Missouri River to the train station on the Iowa side of the river and a train to Chicago where Dorothy had relatives. Um, it, it, it's just, you know, it's, it's hard to get your arms around the odds against this, in some ways, fatherless 
uh, child succeeding, let alone becoming president of the United States. But it happened. And it happened in large measure, <clears throat> I think he'd be the first to say it, because of West Michigan. It happened because, uh, uh, not because of what happened as an infant in Omaha, um, but what happened as a child and uh, uh, a local football hero, and then a seemingly for life congressman. Um, and um, he would credit his mother. Um, she, she, was, she was a remarkable woman. She, a devout churchgoer, but because she was a divorcee, she couldn't be a member of the, uh, of the church when they first arrived. So when she married Gerald Ford Sr., uh, it wasn't with the blessing of the church. And um, that all changed uh, later on. But that was a significant part of his, of his upbringing. Uh, as I say, scouting, which he took you know, really very seriously, athletics. Um, it is also true that he was uh, seemingly born with and spent a lifetime more or less successfully controlling uh, a very bad temper. Um, which surprised people, because he seems like the most genial, easygoing right. person. But he had one of those tempers like a summer thunderstorm. You know, it would come out of nowhere and be seemingly violent for, for a couple minutes, and then it would go away. And, uh, and again, it's interesting, I, <laughs> amazing coincidence. He would politically, if you were putting him on the spectrum, he's an Eisenhower Republican, uh, kind of conservative, certainly on economics, uh, liberal for his time on human rights, sub, uh, voted for all the civil rights legislation in the 1960s. But the, the other thing he had, and Eisenhower uh, looked on him as, um, as almost a protege. But the, the amazing thing they had in common, they both had a reputation for uh, geniality uh, and behind the smile was a, a really uh, bad temper. And the amazing <laughs> parallel. Uh, Eisenhower's mother read to young Dwight Eisenhower the same biblical passage that Dorothy Ford read to young Gerald Ford in an attempt to impress upon him the need to, uh, to, to control his temper. And in both cases it worked <laughs> most of the time. And when it didn't, you, you didn't forget it. Absolutely. All right, let's talk about uh, the pardon and how, it, we, here it comes now in 2024, all of these old debates uh, that we were having 50 years ago, presidential immunity, uh, the power of the executive, right. power as it's <laughs> judged by the court. In fact, I read an article in The Atlantic that John Dean wrote about how Richard Nixon would have been exonerated by today's court. Yeah. Back then, President Ford was making the calculation that let's get this to the sideline because we've got bigger problems to face. I understand the natural human tendency to look for parallels between then and now. And there are some, don't get me wrong. Where I have problems is a kind of ex post facto reasoning. Um, the idea, it's, it's the fact that there is no final word in historical appraisal, and the classic example is the pardon, uh, hugely unpopular at the time. And, and then over time, um, with the passage of time, people began to change their minds to the point where the John F. Kennedy Library gave Ford the Profiles and Courage Award specifically for the pardon um, back at the turn of the century. I remember Ford saying, you know, everywhere I go for 25 years, people ask the same question. And since the Kennedy Library Award, they've stopped asking the question. Well, except they're asking the question again because, uh, you know, the, the, the wheel turns. We're into another generation, another set of events that, that bring back memories of the earlier. And it's very understandable that there are people out there saying, well, see, if Ford hadn't pardoned Nixon, then 
fill in the blank. There's a problem with that. We don't elect our presidents for their clairvoyance. We elect them because of their ability uh, and above all, their ability and their willingness to make the toughest decisions. Because it's only the toughest decisions, as Eisenhower used to say, that reach that desk. And you've got to put yourself, try to put yourself in Ford's shoes in August of 1974. Uh, he's in this job that he never aspired to and ostensibly never, quote, prepared for. He's discovering with every passing day things that he didn't know. Um, literally, the day became, it's like Harry Truman being told about the atomic bomb. Well, in, in Ford's case, there was this bizarre James Bond scheme involving a sunken Russian submarine and how it used. I mean, it doesn't get more bizarre. More 70s. It's, it's all there, okay? <laughs> yeah, right. you, you wouldn't make this stuff up. But the fact is, the CIA had hired Howard Hughes to create a ship ostensibly that was capable of, I mean, pretending to be one thing, but in fact of retrieving a Soviet submarine that had at the bottom of the Pacific. Well, guess what? There was a Soviet trawler trawling this operation. And, and the first day he's president, Ford is told about this. And by the way, you have to decide now whether we go ahead with this because... The ship, by the way, is, is unarmed, and if the Soviets were to board it, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, that, that kind of thing, but in the bigger sense. Ford is hit with the fact that the economy is headed south uh, in ways that were unprecedented. I mean, you, you're supposed to be you had inflation or you had unemployment, but you didn't have both. Well, guess what? In the 70s, we had both. It was called stagflation. stagflation. Um, and he was coming to realize day by day Relations with the Soviets were delicate and, and fraying, not to mention uh, the ship in the, in, the, in the Pacific and the submarine. Vietnam. Uh, you, of course, we were still in Vietnam. I mean, anyway, it was a host of things. And, and I think probably if it had been, if he'd had the luxury of time and a little bit of perspective. But I think he was, I don't think he was overwhelmed, but I think he was unprepared for the sheer volume, magnitude, severity uh, of, of what he was being confronted with. And then, and here's where he, call it naive, I think that's not an unfair characterization. He thought his first press conference was on August 28th. And he really thought that because he was preoccupied with, oh, by the way, there's a war on Cyprus between Turkey and Greece, both NATO members and inflation, et cetera, et cetera, because he was preoccupied with those things, that the press corps would be preoccupied with those things. Well, now that's naive after you've been in Washington 25 years. And the people around him said, no, they're just going to want to talk about Nixon. He said, no, no, you're all wrong. Well, he was all wrong. They want to talk about Nixon and Nixon's tapes and Nixon's legal prospects. For whatever it's worth, Gerald Ford believed that if the process were allowed to play itself out, Richard Nixon would be indicted and, and almost certainly convicted, at least on obstruction of justice charges. And there are those who say, well, he should have let that go forward, and then he could have decided. The problem with that is the country was obsessed, just like the press corps was obsessed. And Ford's trying to learn how to be president. And if Richard Nixon is dominating the public conversation, Ford said, you know, I'm spending 25%, literally, and, I, and I've got the, the daily schedule. I mean, he's spending 25% of his time on, on one man's problems. And meanwhile, the rest of the country is left to fend for itself. The only way... In fact, Richard Nixon left him with a poison chalice. The only way that he could get rid of Nixon, not to forgive Nixon, but to forget Nixon, was to pardon him. And that, in, in, of course, carried with it enormous political downside. Um, and I think, to Ford's credit, um, again, that's why we hire presidents. 
to make tough decisions, including, um, well, for example, I, I think John Kennedy in the, in the latter part of his presidency deserves all of the posthumous uh, admiration because he grew into the office. He came into office, a Cold War president who didn't want to talk about civil rights. And guess what? He realized that uh, you, 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 you can't avoid those subjects. Mm, you got dragged there. There's, there's, a, there's a moral element to the presidency that ultimately transcends the purely short-term political one. And sooner or later, successful presidents, good presidents, whether they get reelected or not, uh, decide that for themselves. And that was Ford's, in effect, moment of truth. But it wasn't his first. We, we forget. The Nixon pardon did not exist in a vacuum. Two weeks before the Nixon pardon, Ford went to Chicago to the VFW convention and announced a conditional pardon for Vietnam War draft Reserve, evaders. Yes. And we forget that now, but that was, that was a big deal. And the fact is, I believe that began the process. I mean, the, the pardon accelerated it, but that began the process of in some ways undermining Ford among his own natural political base, if you will. The, the thing, uh, the, the parts of the pardon story that, that are new and that I think still are not fully explored involve the involvement of West Michigan. Um, Phil, uh, Phil Buchan, um, who was, well, Ford talked about him being the conscience of the administration. And of course, Phil Buchan was a mainstay at Foundry Street Church, and uh, one of his best friends was Duncan Littlefair. And that's a name that uh, you know, a lot of people perhaps have forgotten, but um, Duncan Littlefair was a very controversial, uh, sort of quasi-Unitarian okay. uh, preacher uh, who, unknown to the to the press or the public, was invited to Washington by Phil Buchan, who needed to be convinced that the pardon was morally defensible, because Phil Buchan, as Ford's White House counsel, was the guy who was going to go out and defend it. And interestingly enough, Duncan Littlefair instantly he he, he went to the Jefferson Hotel, where the Buchans were were living, and by the way, where Leon Jaworski the special prosecutor lived, which facilitated um, back and forth a little back away, from, away from the, the cameras. Ford knew through Phil Buchan from Leon Jaworski that it would be two years before Richard Nixon could get a fair trial, given the publicity. The process, I mean, yeah. Abs if ever. So major distraction. So two years, guess what? That was going to take up all the time that Ford was in the White House up until 1976. And that was a, a major contributing factor to his decision to, in effect, bite the bullet. But so was, in my opinion, uh, the fascinating thing is that Phil Buchan, as far as I can see, made no effort to talk Ford out of it. Um, he knew Ford, he knew how Ford um, made up his mind, and uh, once he made up his, I mean, he consulted very widely, but once he made up his mind, it was almost impossible to change it. And this was the West Michigan kind of core belief system coming into play. And, and you see, Ford was surrounded by people who in a normal White House, in a normal presidency, would have, would have reminded him of all the political downside. Or wait until after the midterm elections. Why now? What, what? <laughs> and the amazing, well, there's two things. Um, someone said to Ford, you know, why, why now? And he said, well, because the press will ask me about it. And he stopped to think about that. I mean, anyone else would, would say that, wouldn't think that. Well, so, so what if the press ask you about it? You know, punt. You don't have to lie. Um, tell them you haven't decided. And Ford's response was, but I have decided. Well, <laughs> how are you going to counter that? That's what's Michigan. I think. But Duncan Little Fair wrote out a draft statement late at night, and it emphasized Christian mercy. Now, 
if you look at the, uh, and it's obvious online, look at Ford's statement. First of all, it was Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, I think. which was Another odd, Sunday morning uh, or Sunday announcement from well, a president. Well, it's just a <laughs> real, well, the press, <laughs> I talked to the deputy press secretary whose job it was to, to marshal the pool. Um, and they were all wondering, first of all, they didn't want to be there. It was Sunday morning. And they and they're wondering why they were there, and the assumption was it was kind of military action. And then one reporter piped up, said, "I'll bet he's pardoning Nixon." And this was greeted with laughter, derisive laughter, from the rest of the reporters, which shows you just how improbable this whole thing seemed. In any event, um, the problem, looking back, was not just the pardon, or even how the pardon was handled or when it was announced, which I think sat badly with a lot of people. The, the fact is there were a lot of people on Capitol Hill, utter hypocrites, who, who, who called for it that afternoon and said, you know, I know you're doing the right thing and history will reward you for it, but I'm going to, you know, beat you all up in the first, front of the first camera. And Ford had been around, he understood. He was not prepared for the ferocity of, of the reaction to the pardon. But they made it worse because Phil Buchan went out the next day and talked about mercy. And, it, and that's perfectly understandable because that was a significant part of the, uh, of the Ford statement. Well, it was a significant part of the Ford statement because, in my opinion, Duncan Littlefair put it there. Um, but the fact is the American people weren't feeling very merciful in September of 1974. And Ford himself, and this here's, I think, where you can fault him because he said right away, well, that's not why I pardoned him. I pardoned him for the very practical reason that Nixon was taking time away from all of these other issues. But he didn't say that. And so um, you had a lot of people who in their own mind, for the best of motives, wound up doing what was politically the worst of consequences. And overnight, Ford's poll ratings dropped 22 points, which is the, the biggest drop in the history of polling. Now, he came back, and I think it's, a, it's widely believed that the, the pardon was the single biggest factor in his very narrow loss to Jimmy Carter in 76. I think that's highly questionable. I think it was the, the economy and the fact is at the very, very last minute there were some bad economic numbers over the last weekend. And what had happened was Ford had caught up, but there was this kind of sudden pullback, in my opinion, on the part of voters who had been led to expect all through the campaign that this was a done deal. Jimmy Carter was going to be president. And then all of a sudden, in the last 48 hours, they were confronted with this new reality that, hey, wait a second, maybe Jerry Ford is, is going to win. And Doug Bailey, who, was the, who did all the TV for the campaign, brilliant strategist, told me if at the end of the campaign, if voters went into the voting booth, thinking, gee, I don't know enough about Jimmy Carter, then Ford would win. If, on the other hand, they went in thinking, um, Jerry Ford's going to have a full term, then Jimmy Carter would win. And I think what happened, ironically, it was almost a backlash, as it suddenly dawned on people that, hey, wait, the, the story, the narrative of this campaign isn't what we thought it was. And then, of course, to have some bad economic numbers at the very end, it just reinforced that. Yeah, and that stung, but he wasn't done politically after 76. And there was another interesting uh, note in your book yeah. that as in the run-up to 1980, well, first, let's, you talked about the, the surgent right in the Republican yeah. Party with Reagan, and that that was the first sign of, of headwinds of kind of what we're experiencing Absolute. today. You There's can draw a, an absolute direct line let, from yeah. today back to 19. So his dealings with Reagan then as he's trying to navigate that side of the party. Right. 76, 
Reagan challenges them. And, and these, yeah, absolutely. These well, Ford could never understand, and again, maybe there's a little bit of naivete. He said, you know, I keep reading I'm the most conservative president since Calvin Coolidge. And so I don't understand why anyone's challenging me from the right. Plus, remember, Ford was a child of the, the Great Depression, the New Deal, World War II. Um, he was definitely right of center, but he was um, a, 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 a conservative realist. And his formula, and there was plenty of evidence to back it up, for a Republican to win the presidency in those days when Democratic registration dwarfed Republican, etc., for a Republican to win, basically uh, the formula was you nominate the most conservative candidate who can, quote, appeal to the broad middle ground. I think Dwight Eisenhower, uh, a classic example. And Ford thought of himself very much in that, in that mold. And what he didn't realize was the ground was shifting from under his feet, literally, as he was president. And the party was even then emotionally, uh, if not um, strategically, already Ronald Reagan's party. And if the Reagan people had run a smarter campaign in 76, I mean, there were states where they weren't even on the primary ballot. But, I mean, people forget how close run that thing was. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the choice of Bob Dole as his running mate was dictated to by the fact them. that they didn't even have the base at that point. Um, there were other names, you know, uh, Bill Ruckelshaus, uh, even Ann Armstrong from Texas was, it was a Hail Mary kind of pass. But the fact is, and Ford knew the Midwest, um, the, the polls showed Kansas and Nebraska weren't nailed down. Well, if you don't have the farm states, and you're a Republican. And so, but, but that was, in effect, it was, a, it was evidence of, of weakness. What, what people have forgotten, people talk about Reagan's speech the last night of the convention. It's kind of the first speech of the campaign. And that's true, but they, they should not overlook that Ford gave the speech of his life. Um, uh, William F. Buckley, who was in many ways um, simpatico with, with the Reagan right, nevertheless, he wrote a column. He said, it's as if Joe Palooka, uh, you expected Joe Palooka to show up and Cicero <laughs> gave the speech <laughs> instead. Well, you know, a bit of an exaggeration, but expectations were low. And that was the beginning. People forget, again, Ford came out of the Democratic Convention 25, 30 points down. No, no candidate for president had ever been that far behind his opponent. And, um, and he lost by less than two points. Um, notwithstanding the debate and the Polish gaffe, uh, which stopped the momentum for, you know, for a few days. So it, it, was, it was a remarkable comeback. And had he, God knows, well, had 9,000 votes changed hands in Ohio and Hawaii, he would have made people forget Harry Truman's come from behind victory in 1948. Yeah, that's remarkable. Let's talk about post-presidency and President Ford's kind of reconnecting with West Michigan. It started with the museum, obviously, but you know, in, even in my time here, I can remember him coming back several times. Oh, back. gosh. He's okay. really did yeah. embrace the area again, even having lived out west all those years. Yeah. Gerald Ford emotionally never left West Michigan. And the best evidence of that is he may have lived on the West Coast. Okay, split their time between Rancho Mirage and Vail. Um, but it was just that he came back a lot. I mean, I know when I was director of the museum, I mean, he came back half a dozen times a year for sometimes more often. I mean, he come back, the Christmas tree lighting was initiated, and he came from Colorado to do it. Um, we did, 25 years ago, the 25th anniversary of the Ford presidency, it was also leading up to the millennium. We did a big lecture series, and that was the year Billy Graham came to town, and Alan Greenspan came, and Justice Stevens, John Paul Stevens came. 
And for every one of those, Ford would come back from California just to introduce them. Um, because he also could show them around Grand Rapids. He was so proud of this town. And one of the things he, he took extraordinary pride in is, is, is the museum. And not because it was a museum about him, but because of the spark it provided for the renewal of this city. Uh, the night before the 76 election, there was a big homecoming and thousands of people turned out. Secret Service was concerned about the program because there were so many empty storefronts and, and vacant second floor windows. And he had had two attempts against him. That's right. And, and they didn't know if they could cover them all. But what that said to the city fathers was, um, you know, our downtown is hurting. Um, and remember, of course, we had a really bad experience with, quote, urban renewal in the 60s, when urban renewal meant knocking down buildings. Getting rid of Heritage Hill. Yeah. So, we, you know, if we we're going to try it again, we we're going to do it differently this time. Right. And Ford was offered, Fred Meyer, very generously, offered him land on the outskirts of town. Well, first of all, he had decided to give the papers years ago to the university. That was the academic side of the enterprise that made sense. But Ford, once a congressman, always a congressman, split the baby. And he wanted to do something for Grand Rapids. So he was going to put the museum, which was a tourist attraction, economic benefits, um, he was going to put it in Grand Rapids, but not just anywhere in Grand Rapids. As I said, Fred Meyer offered him the, actually, I believe, the, the, the land on which the Meyer Gardens is now yeah. located. And the president thanked him profusely, but he said, I really want to put it downtown. And, and again, I keep saying people forget, but people have short memories. And that's almost 50 years ago. Uh, but downtown was in pretty bad shape. And the river was, had yet to be rediscovered, put it that way. Well, the museum opened the same week as the Pantland, now the, the Amway Grand. I remember we, <laughs> we interviewed uh, Rich DeVos as part of this oral history project, we are talking about the, the Pantland. And they asked, okay, what will it cost to restore this place, you know, back to a semblance of its former glory? And they were told, the experts told him, $6 million. And as Rich said, $20 million later, you know, we were ready to open it. Well, it opened simultaneously with the Ford Museum. And th that was the spark. That's what that's what showed to the doubters and the naysayers that, in fact, hey, wait, you know, great things can happen in this town. And um, one thing led to another, led to another. And, you know, the rest, as I say, is history. And Ford followed every step of the way. And, and not from a distance. Secret Service agents that I've talked to, whenever he came back to Grand Rapids, which was often, uh, he, he loved to be driven around to old neighborhoods, you know, and to relive, you know, and to point out that's where Betty and I lived, et cetera, et cetera. But equally important, I mean, he, uh, he was at the opening of the public museum. Yep. Um, he did both the groundbreaking and the dedication for the Van Andel Institute. Uh, I mean, he, he followed. And in the end, all you need to know when you ask how much did of an impact Grand Rapids made on him. I remembered my eulogy. I quoted a reliable source uh, who was quoting President Ford near the end of his life who said, you know at night when I have trouble sleeping, I go back to Grand Rapids. And not just to relive, I think, his, his early days but everything that had happened since. And I think probably one of the things, he would never say this, but I, I think one of the things he probably was proudest of was the, the contribution that the Ford Museum made to getting things started. And um, no, I mean, he is, um, well, and of course there was never any doubt, people wondered because there were people in Grand Rapids who were upset when he didn't come back here in 1977. And I remember 
talking to someone who had, uh, God, they, it was late in the afternoon, they were out in Rancho Mirage, they'd just come off the golf course, and the sun was just setting over the mountains there in um, near Palm Springs. And Ford looked at him and said, see why we live here? You know? Well, if you've been, you, you could understand. But he lived there physically, but, but again, emotionally. Uh, the, the essence of Gerald Ford never left Grand Rapids. I want to wrap with uh, after he passed. Yeah. Um, the night that his body was in repose here at the museum. Yeah. There was a line that stretched. Did you, were you able to absorb that? And well, I, I guess, give me some of your recollections about yeah, that particular evening in the cold. I had been involved in the funeral planning for several years. And it, what people don't realize is the moment you become president, the military district of Washington basically comes to you with a funeral plan. Uh, and then, of course, you, you, you can tinker it and personalize it and and an utterly characteristic of Gerald Ford and Mrs. Ford, who I remember sitting in the first meeting out there in Rancho Mirage, and she kept saying, keep it simple, keep it simple, think of the family. From the first, it was planned as a family funeral, and family in the broadest sense, including the Grand Rapids family. Um, and he wanted it simplified. Um, so, for example, there was no um, case on through the streets of Washington. And there were some in the military who tried to dissuade him from that because this was their show. And he made it very clear. He, he, didn't, he didn't want that. Um, as I said, he wanted a funeral that was more Truman-esque than Reagan-esque. And that's not putting down President Reagan. He, President Reagan deserved uh, you know, the, the, the pomp and pageantry um, surrounding his death, which was a really historic event. Um, Ford was a very modest man. And um, I think he would have been in some ways embarrassed by that kind of treatment. But there were touches that he knew about and that he approved of. And one of the most moving, I, I said later on, you know, he'd never been a television president. And, and the, the best moments of that week were not on camera, by and large. We were on Air Force One flying back from Washington. And by the way, just to drive a point home, there was never any doubt that at the end of his life, uh, he would be brought back to Grand Rapids. That was always, that was built in to the idea of, of a museum. So anyway, so we were on our way back. And the picture that I will, of that week, and there are many, uh, hopefully that I will never forget, but Jimmy Carter was walking up and down the aisle of Air Force One, and over his shoulder, he had Gerald Ford's youngest infant great-grandchild. And I thought to myself, not for the last time that week, you know, 30 years later, who would have thought the story ends this way? Because the Ford Carter, they were not friends at the end of the 76 campaign. And they became very good friends. And the wives became very good friends, and, and, the, and the families did. And it was interesting because the Carters said they were the ones who, who were most blown away by that line that stretched all the way down Bridge Street. There were 65,000 people. I don't know how they crammed them in because that was you know, a little more than 12 hours that went by the president's casket. And it was a, a January night, and we were blessed. It was wonderful weather, but it was still January. And the Carters were just absolutely blown away. Uh, they, they couldn't believe not only that line, but all of the people from the, coming in from the airport and all of the signs and uh, the obvious outpouring of affection. Um, and I, you know, I don't know what people expected. I mean, I remember being a little blown away by what I saw, um, but you can't really prepare. But I'm told as a result 
of their experiences that week in Grand Rapids. The Carters redid their own funeral planning to make it much more family um, uh, oriented. Community centered. Absolutely. Uh, celebrate us. Yeah. And well, and you saw that with, with Mrs. Carter and the emphasis on planes. Yeah. What, you know, what, what planes was to Jimmy Carter, Grand Rapids was right. to Gerald Ford. Um, but anyway, um, what else? I don't know. I, no, I, well, I, thought. I, I, we, I was going to say, if you have anything else that you want to add, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to take up any more. We oh, could no, talk no, for no, hours no. about this. Yep. I, I do find it it's interesting. It's not lost on me that you live right above. Well, you know, it is interesting. I, I have feel spent, like a caretaker. Yeah, I, yeah, of their I, well, image. it's funny. Uh, you know, I I didn't think about that when I when I bought this place, but um, I wrote the Ford book on that desk, and that desk is placed in front of the window that overlooks the Ford gravesite. And at least during that part of the year when the trees don't block it, uh, that's what I can see. So, you know, there, I suppose there is that psychic connection in, in some ways. Um, it's funny how things come full circle. I mean, I first came to Grand Rapids in 95. It was, um, I want to say, yeah, the fall of 95. Because I'd interviewed with him for the job out in California. Um, and he said, you ought to see Grand Rapids again. You, you know, you got to see Grand Rapids. So anyway, I, I, I came here. And, uh, and I do remember vividly the day of the funeral, we were standing at the gravesite for the interment. And I looked up in this building was half built. And floor after floor after floor, there were construction workers who had taken off their hard hats. And many of them put over their hearts. And it was such an extraordinarily moving, um, natural <clears throat> gesture. And I remember <laughs> thinking before we left the gravesite, I'm going to live in that building. Uh, I don't know why, but it, it then things just happened. I don't know whether it was foreordained, but I'm happy they, they turned out the way they did. And um, it became possible to, you know, to take 10 years and do the Ford book. And um, the rest is history. Well, that's a remarkable achievement. I have not read the entire book. Well, I've been picking through it, but no, I mean, no, no. I, this is a doorstopper. I mean, this is a well, you know, and it's it's funny, but, but you know, there haven't been a lot of books written about Ford. No. And my view from the beginning was, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. You, you're you know, you're never supposed to use the word definitive. You're supposed to let critics hopefully use that word. But the fact is, that's what I was aiming for. I mean, I was aiming for knowing that there probably wouldn't be a lot of other big books written. And because I had, you know, some advantages, uh, the, I know a lot of people and, 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 you know, all that. And I was willing to give it 10 years, which a lot of people wouldn't. And uh, so I figured, okay, I'm going to tell the whole story because it wouldn't have been that long if it didn't turn out that there was much more of a story than even I had believed. I mean, I was surprised. I thought I knew him pretty well. And I learned a lot of things that I that I didn't know. So um, that's one reason why. And because I have very tolerant editors who, you know, the Rockefeller book was even longer. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, I did want to ask, there was one other question yeah. about, um, I, I did see it in one of your interviews where you were speaking about Ford they had asked him about future presidents, oh, and, and, and he was he used the word yeah, arrogant. Yeah, yeah. Arrogant. That's where I, literally you're taking the words out of my mouth. Um, people ask me all the time, and I understand it's a perfectly logical question. You know, what would Ford think about fill in the blank? And I think it's uh, presumptuous of biographers to to in effect put words in the mouth of a dead man, and I won't do it. But I will tell you a story that I think is uh, apropos of what we are going through politically. It was in 1980, 
And uh, he did an interview with Neil McNeil, who was a Times legendary Capitol Hill correspondent, someone Ford knew very well, trusted implicitly. And McNeil did something really smart, because typically in those interviews, at some point, the former president is asked to list the qualities for a successful presidency. And McNeil turned that question on its head and said, Mr. President, what do you think is the one worst quality for a president? In effect, what, what is the disqualifying quality? And Ford thought for a minute, and he said, arrogance. And then, of course, immediately, being Ford, he said, not that the American people would ever elect an arrogant president. He said, but if they did, and he said, and I'm talking vicious arrogance, he said, then God help the country. 